Good afternoon, and welcome to the session of uh, serverless architecture. So, uh, I'm Prakash Panisami. I'm a solution architect with AWS. So, in this session, in this session, we are going to uh, briefly talk about what basically serverless is and what are the components of serverless, and then we are going to look into some of the architecture best practices that we can uh, cover on various different uh, application or use cases. Okay, so what is serverless? When it when we say serverless, what we mean is like uh, removing the uh, heavy lifting for you. Basically, like we take care of all the server operations, so you don't need to uh, worry about managing any of the servers and stuff like that. So when it comes to serverless, so we have these four important tenets. So one is you don't need to worry about servers. You don't need to provision any servers. You don't need to maintain patching. Any of those things you don't need to manage. The next thing is you pay only for what you use. So effectively, uh, in a normal case, you, you provision and then you pay for it all the time it is being running. Whereas in case of serverless, you pay only for what you're exactly using. Another thing is you don't need to worry about scaling. In the sense like, you can, can be a small startup, start with 100 users per second, you can scale to 100,000 users per second, and then it will be able to handle it for you without any major architectural changes, and then it should happen gracefully. The, another important thing is uh, high availability and security aspect of it. So it should come transparent to you. So uh, you, need, you don't need to worry about whether I am deployed that in multiple AZ or in multiple data center kind of construct. So it automatically handles that for you, and then it scales uh, across different availability zones. So you don't need to worry about the scalability part. OK, when it comes to serverless, in AWS, we have various different services which we call as serverless, which have this, the four tenants that we discussed before. Today, we are going to talk about compute part of it. We are going to talk about the, how serverless compute can be done. So, and as you see here, uh, there are lots of customers who love serverless. It, it can range from various customers, from a small startup to mid-range companies to public sector companies like governments, and also uh, very big corporates like uh, Coca-Cola, Jet Propulsion Labs, many of them using uh, serverless applications. One, one typical example is Findra. Findra uh, has a very unique use case where they have uh, yeah, kind of a Hadoop environment, which they thought of, they were running on-premise, and then they thought of migrating to EC2. When, we are, when they were evaluating this use case, they identified, okay, probably serverless might be helping them. So they started using serverless technologies like uh, AWS Lambda, Amazon S3, Amazon SQS, and then they were able to achieve the whole modeling and the evaluation just using the serverless technology, and then they were able to developed the whole solution within three months, and it saved them lots of money. At the same time, it was able to performing faster than what they were doing before. Okay, now let's a little bit focus on the compute part of it, right? So when we talk about serverless compute, there are the two major things. One is AWS Lambda, and the other one is AWS Fargate. Uh, when it comes to AWS Lambda, it is, uh, so you, you write a code, which, is, which we call as functions, and then it will be triggered by an event and you can able to uh, scale that automatically without worrying about any of the other configurations. So that's the advantage of Lambda functions. When it comes to, the, there are most of the cases that you can do with AWS Lambda. There are some use cases where you might need kind of a network kind of boundaries, or you might have a situations where like I want to connect this particular network to a specific another network or uh, applications. So in those cases, probably you might use AWS Fargate, which is basically container as a service, so you can able to launch your container and then you don't uh, worry about the time limitations which have with Lambda, and then you can able to run it as, as long as that you want. So that's the another advantage of Fargate. Okay, now let's uh, dig a little bit into uh, AWS Lambda. So as I mentioned, right, so when you write a Lambda function, which is basically a code that you write, which we call as functions in AWS Lambda's parallels. And this function can be written in various programming languages. Currently we support uh, Node.js, Python, Java, uh, Go, C Sharp. So you can write uh, any of these languages, and whenever you need to invoke this function, you need an event. So that event source can be multiple different types. Either you can manually uh, invoke that event, or it can automatically invoke through a various different event streams. So there will be some event which will be triggering this Lambda function, and once it triggers the Lambda function, that Lambda function will make a business logic, and when you're making the business logic, it can connect to an external service, or it can talk to another AWS service, or the various things. Like it can able to connect to any of the uh, other application that is running in VPC. So it's completely possible. 
Okay, as I mentioned, right, serverless is mostly kind of an operating model. So this is kind of an overview of various operating model that we have. So if you could look at the bottom, which is basically EC2, which is virtual machines. So when it comes to virtual machines, as you see, the responsibility of AWS is uh, taking care of physical servers and hypervisors, and then uh, completely all other things like operating system, patching operating system, security, all those things become your responsibility. As you move up the ladder, as you see here, if you go to container management solutions, AWS take care of the whole container management, whereas you need to take care of the worker nodes, and also you need to make sure what are the applications that you're deploying in the worker nodes and also the containers. The next level is Fargate, where you just need to manage about your container images. So you just take care of container images, what are all the packages that you're building as part of the container images, that becomes your responsibility, everything else becomes AWS responsibility. The next level, as you see here, you offload most of the responsibility to AWS. You just take care of your function code, and then security of the function code. So that becomes your only responsibility. So the advantage of this is, since you can offload most of the responsibility, you can spend more time on developing your own application. So you can able to innovate and then spend more time on your innovation instead of managing the servers or patching the servers. How we can use AWS Lambda? So you'll, you'll be writing a Lambda functions using uh, various different programming languages that I mentioned. And along with that, you can also bring all the, all the available public libraries. For example, if you're using Python or Node.js or any of the programming languages, if there are any libraries that you're using, you can able to bring that library as part of the package that you're creating for the Lambda functions. And Lambda console comes up with uh, the Cloud9 interface, which is basically an IDE. So online IDE, you can able to write your Lambda function directly on the console. If you don't want that, if you want to do, it also supports various different IDEs. So we have plugins for various IDEs and then you can able to use them uh, to program in the way that you're already doing it. And when it comes to configuring the Lambda function, the configuring Lambda function is usually based on the memory. So you only one parameter that you're going to configure, what is the size of the memory? So based on the memory size that you configured, your CPU and the network performance will scale proportionally. So you are offloading most of the responsibility so it becomes easier for you whenever you start using Lambda functions. Okay. A uh, couple of slides back, we see that there's a Lambda function and there will be an event which will be triggering the Lambda functions. So here you see uh, a whole bunch of event sources that can trigger a Lambda function. So you can see like, for example, when it comes to a data stores, there can be S3, where you can store an object in S3. Whenever you store an object in S3, it automatically can trigger a Lambda function. Or when it comes to messaging, for example, you can have an SNS, um, SNS is basically a topic where you send a message to the topic, that message will be automatically triggering a Lambda function, and then you can able to process whatever in that message. Or you can able to schedule the Lambda function based on the cron jobs. Or if you look at Alexa, most of the Alexa backend these days runs on Lambda. It's a very common use case, right? So you don't need to run a server always. Only whenever a user makes an Alexa call, then you need to run that. So in that case, Lambda becomes a very uh, natural use case for it. Like, you don't pay for a static uh, server always running. You pay only whenever somebody uses that, and then it becomes a right, very good choice for those kind of applications. Okay, so we talked about event sources. Uh, the next one is execution model. So, okay, I have an event, and that event will be triggering a Lambda function. There are three different ways that Lambda function can behave. So, first one is synchronous execution. When you are having an API, you send a request, and then you usually immediately request a response. So that is a request response model, which is a synchronous model. Uh, the next one is asynchronous uh, event model, where let us say, like uh, as I mentioned, either you send a message to an SNS topic, or you send a, upload a file to S3. So those cases that can trigger a Lambda function, which can happen asynchronously, and then get the response back for you. Uh, the, another third execution model is stream, stream processing, which works mostly in case of DynamoDB streams and Kinesis streams. So whenever there's a changes that is happening to DynamoDB, that can trigger a Lambda function. So, or whenever, so let's say you have a clickstream website, you have a website and then you're getting a clickstream data which needs to be sent to Kinesis streams, which you can have a Lambda and then do a real-time processing using Lambda functions. That's one example. So these are all the execution models with Lambda function. Okay, how would Lambda help development easier? Uh, I mentioned Lambda supports uh, like five or six uh, runtimes. Apart from that, if you are more familiar with a different runtime, like different programming languages, then you can bring your own programming languages. So you can build your own custom runtime, and then bring your own language. If you look at, there are already currently, there are lots of open source that is available in open source repositories for programming languages like Rust, Perl, PHP, 
which are directly not supported by Lambda, but it is a custom runtime that you can bring. And uh, there is another interesting uh, aspect for Lambda function that we launched at reInvent is layers. So basically, let us say like, if you have a common code or a common functionality that should be applied to every Lambda function that you create in your account, what you can create is you can create a layer, and then you can share that layer within your account or multiple accounts, and then that layer can be added as part of your Lambda function. So you can able to share a common code across multiple functions. And as I mentioned, uh, Lambda also has integration with various IDEs. They have plugins, so it, it provides local debugging. Uh, you can do a tracing locally and then see whenever you develop a Lambda functions. And we also enabled integrations with SQS. SQS is a queuing service, so you can able to uh, build a queue-based processing service um, that adds additional advantage, like uh, you can able to, uh, don't need to wait for a synchronous actions. You can put it in the queue and then you can process it based on the queue a later point in time. And we also added an integration with load balancers. So earlier, you need to always have an API interface in front of Lambda to make an a API call. Now you can have a load balancer and then you can make an API call directly to Lambda function through a load balancer. Okay, so we talked about events, we talked about execution models. Uh, the next one is uh, permissions. Did it move? When we talk about permissions, there are uh, two important permission models. So one is uh, invoke. So the function policies is basically who has the permissions to make changes to the Lambda function or who can invoke the Lambda function. So in some cases it can be uh, API gateway or it can be whatever event stream which can trigger the Lambda function. That, that's the permission that they need to have. The next one is execution policies. The execution policies is basically um, what the Lambda function can do. For example, you have a Lambda function and then it needs to uh, download a file from S3. Then you need to uh, define the Lambda role policies such that the Lambda has a permission so that it can go and download the file from S3 or upload the file to S3. So this is the two different security construct with the Lambda. Next one is how well basic Lambda function looks. As you see here, you have a Lambda function. Lambda function has uh, two different parameters passed as part of its event handler. So whenever you create a Lambda function, it will be having a handler function. The handler function is what be invoked whenever a new event comes in. And that whenever it gets invoked, it has two parameters. One is event. Event contains the actual data payload that comes as part of the event. And then we have the context. The context parameter contains the actual Lambda context. So you can able to identify how much time remaining in the Lambda function, all, all those kind of things as part of the Lambda context. In some case of asynchronous uh, programming languages like Java script, you can able to perform a callback using the, uh, the context object. Okay, so we seen um, various different aspects of Lambda function. Now let's look into the API gateway. So API gateway is a fully managed API service. It, you can able to build a uh, unified API platform using API gateway. It handles authentication and authorization for you. You can able to throttle you can able to perform DDoS production. Various things are possible with API Gateway. Another advantage is you can able to create a plan with API Gateway. For example, if you have a premium users, that can, you can configure it such that the premium user can have 100,000 requests per second. And in case of free users, you can restrict it only to 10 requests per second or 50 requests per second. So you can able to define a usage plan using API Gateway seamlessly. So let's look a little deep into how API Gateway architecture works. As you see here, uh, you have an uh, application which makes an uh, API call to API Gateway. API Gateway come in, uh, you can configure an API Gateway in two different ways. Either it can be an edge optimized endpoint or regional endpoint. So edge optimized, end, when you have an edge optimized endpoint, it will have a cloud front, basically a content delivery network in front of it. So you can able to invoke anywhere from the globe with a better latency. In case of regional optimized API, it will be better performing within the regional location. So whenever you make an API call to uh, API Gateway, it goes to, in case of edge optimized, it will go to the CloudFront, and then see if the data is in CloudFront cache. If it is, it immediately respond back with the cache content. If not, it will go to the API Gateway backend. The API Gateway backend will check its own cache if you have configured it, and then get that value from the API Gateway cache and then respond back. Only if it is not there in the API Gateway cache, it will go to the backend to make, make that request. And the backend can be various different applications. It can be an EC2 instance, or it can be containers running in a VPC, or it can be a public HTTP endpoint. 
or it can be another AWS service. For example, if you just want to query data from a DynamoDB da database table, you can directly integrate API Gateway with DynamoDB table. And then directly query the data from DynamoDB table through API Gateway instead of having another Lambda function in between it. Okay, so we talked about uh, compute, serverless compute and then API management. The next interesting part, as you know, Lambda is serverless and then stateless. So it's just like a function, you provide an input and then you expect an output. Whereas when you're building an application, you need to be stateful. In that case, you need a state machine. That's what AWS step functions is. AWS step function acts as a state machine where you can able to uh, integrate multiple Lambda functions to create a stateful application. Uh, the advantages with step functions is you can able to uh, create a, you, you can act as a, you can build the step function as a part of a code. You can build a JSON file and then provide that uh, to step function. Step functions create the flow for you. You can create sequential uh, retries, uh, error handling, or parallel executions. You can do multiple different things with step functions. And you can uh, automatically uh, track what's happening at each stages. So whether it succeeded or failed, you can able to track at each stage. And then you can able to dive deep on each stage to fa see what, whether it's a failure, what is the stack trace of that failure, and then able to debug what happens at that stage. OK, the next one is uh, security part. Uh, so you have a serverless application, and you want to make sure only authenticated users are able to log into that application. Then we have uh, two different ways that you can integrate security with API Gateway. One is identity and access management. If you have an internal, if your application is just internal and then you have an uh, IAM role that you can assume, then you can use AWS IAM so that you can able to make an API call to that API endpoint only through an authenticated IAM user. Another option is using Amazon Cognito. Amazon Cognito is an user uh, management, user authentication management service. Cognito has two different components. One is federated identities and the, um, uh, Cognito user pools. Uh, so if you already have a user directory on-premise or uh, different, like, different directories, like any of the federated identities, so what you can do is you can integrate that directly with a Cognito federated identity, and then you can just use the same user directory and then make that to authenticate to your application. Let's say if you don't have a user directory at all, you want to build your own user directory, then you can use Cognito user pools so that you can build your user directories which enables both sign up, sign ins, and all those things are handled transparently for you. It's a fully managed service. Then you can able to manage it uh, transparently and handle it in a better way with Amazon Cognito user pools. Okay, so we talked about security executions, uh, API managements. The next one is logging and monitoring. So we use CloudWatch to perform the monitoring. So CloudWatch has two important components to it. One is metrics, CloudWatch metrics, and then one is CloudWatch logs. So CloudWatch metrics is where you collect the metrics from any of the services. For example, in case of Lambda, how much time it took to execute that Lambda function become a metric. That will be available in CloudWatch metrics, so you can able to see the graph to understand how your Lambda functions are performing. In case of API Gateway, you can see the latency of your API endpoint. You can able to see the uh, error rate how much 400 errors or 500 errors are my API endpoint is receiving. You can able to monitor all those things using CloudWatch metrics. And then um, both Lambda and API Gateway writes the logs to CloudWatch logs. So you can able to go and dive deep to see what happened in the function or an API Gateway execution to understand if it is performing as expected. So let us take an example, like you have a Lambda functions, and then one of the Lambda functions is taking a long time. You identified that using CloudWatch metrics. You want to dive deep to understand what happens. That's when you start using AWS X-Ray. AWS X-Ray is a, a tracing service where it helps you to trace the whole flow of the execution. Um, and then you can able to see how much time it took for the execution at each stages so that you can able to see how much time it takes for the container to start up, how much time it took for the runtime, and then how much time it took for the Lambda execution so that you can able to optimize your code based on the execution time. And also you can able to see the stack trace uh, from the X-Ray. X-Ray also will create a service map so that it will create a map as shown in the figure so that you can see the connectivities and then flow of the data between each functions in your application that you developed. Okay, so we talked about security monitoring and various different aspects of serverless. Another important thing is infrastructure as a code. So when you are building a serverless application, it is highly recommended that you build as an infrastructure as a code because that enables you to perform the normal software life, software development lifecycle that you do with any code. So you can able to do unit testing, you can able to do uh, linting and all those things as part of the infrastructure as well, also. 
So that's where a serverless application model, which we call as SAM, can help you to build an infrastructure as a code for serverless applications. Uh, so it is just an extension of CloudFormation. So whatever you can do with CloudFormation, you can also be able to do with serverless application model, but in a more uh, easier, friendly way for serverless applications. So it includes functions for Lambdas, API Gateway, and DynamoDB, so you can be able to uh, easily configure those resources easily with serverless application model. And it also includes some of the capabilities like build, deploy, and package. So you can use this build, deploy, package command to package the whole serverless application and then deploy it directly from the command line. Or you can able to automate it as part of the, your continuous delivery pipeline. And there is also a serverless application repository uh, where lots of people have published their uh, serverless application and the code will be available in uh, open source repositories. So you can able to go and check those repositories and uh, review the code, whether it might be useful. You can also develop your own serverless application and then publish in serverless application repository for others to use. Okay, so this gives you an overview about various different serverless constructs. So now let's look into some of the common architecture patterns. So these are all the, some of the common use cases that we have seen across with serverless. Start from web applications to automation, to chatbots, to big data processing or stream processing. There are various different use cases that we have seen that serverless applications are being used. Let's look into uh, one of the use cases like web applications. So when it comes to web applications, the characteristics is like you have a static and dynamic content and it should be available globally and then it should make sure that it is scalable and it can handle microservice kind of architecture. So considering all these factors, when we look into a design, so see here, we have S3, which is where that uh, storage, so you store all your static content of the website in S3, which acts as a static website, which is front ended by a cloud front, which is basically a content delivery network, so you can get a faster response time to the end users. So this serves the static content. Then uh, to make a dynamic content, you make another call to the API gateway, so the, Java, the HTML files might have a JavaScript uh, integrated with it. The JavaScript make an API called API Gateway, which has a dynam uh, J Lambda backend, which performs some business logic and then update the data to DynamoDB and then retrieve the data and then return it back to the end users. And this is kind of a single kind of microservice, whereas you can able to build multiple similar microservices using this model. So now you have a, you have the serverless application in a single region. So let's say if you want to uh, go to global region. So what you can do is you can use Route 53, which is acts as a traffic manager, so that you can able to distribute the traffic across two different deployments in different regions. For example, if you want to route traffic based on geo-based routing, okay, this particular IP ranges, I should send traffic to Ireland, the other ranges I will send traffic to Frankfurt, or you can able to tra uh, route based on the weights, like 50% there, 60% there, like 40. So you can able to distribute based on the weights. Uh, using Route 53. That can also help you to perform A-B kind of testing on different applications. Now let's look at the uh, another customer use case, Buzzle. It's one of the uh, fashion website which uh, they want to, they're having a high difficulty with their web application scaling when they started using uh, virtual machine based uh, web application. So they started building their web application on serverless using AWS API Gateway and AWS Lambda. They were able to uh, achieve much better uh, performance. At the same time, they saved a significant cost using serverless model. Now let's look at an another use case. Uh, let's say uh, this is an automation use case. When it comes to automation, there are different characteristics, right? It can be triggered on a time basis or it can be triggered based on an event and most cases it will be, you will be able to audit and then see what happened when, it, when an automation job has run. And it also should be able to handle multiple different AWS functionalities that are supported. So let's look at an example. So this is to enforce security policies. So let's say like you want to make sure that nobody in your company should open SSH or RDB port to the whole world. So in this example, so what happens is whenever somebody opens an RDB port to the whole world, uh, it will be sending an event CloudWatch will send an event which will trigger a Lambda function which automatically check the security group and then remove that security group rule automatically uh, and then it will send a notification saying that this particular action has been happened so that you can able to monitor what happened. At the same time, 
we can able to reactively fix whenever something happened without leaving it for a long time when you can able to automate these things. Another example is Autodesk. So Autodesk uh, has uh, uh, challenges when they had to uh, provision an account. They had a process to manually provision the account which usually takes 10 days earlier. So they used a serverless and then they built something called AWS Tailor which is open sourced uh, and available in GitHub which is used in using serverless technology. They were able to automate the whole account provisioning process uh, and they were able to achieve that whole thing in a self-service model within 10 minutes instead of 10, 10 days before. Another uh, example of automation is AWS Ops Automator. So Ops Automator is kind of a framework which can help you to automate most of the uh, operations tasks. For example, if you want to take a snapshot, EBS snapshots, if you want to take a snapshot of Redshift uh, database, data warehouse instances, or you want to back up anything, those kind of operational tasks, you can able to schedule it with Ops Automator and Ops Automator automatically handles that for you. So as in this example, as you see here, you have a cron-based schedule, which is basically CloudWatch events which will automatically trigger a Lambda function, which will go and check the configuration in the DynamoDB, whether you have configured any of the ops automation part, like uh, at this day, this time, I want to take a backup of a cert certain set of instances. If you have scheduled it, it will trigger a Lambda functions to go and take the backup. And that Lambda function, once it backs up, it will update the DynamoDB table saying that this backup has been happened. And then it will also send a notification saying, okay, the backup or whatever the automation job has been completed. Again, the advantage of this is it's your, since you're using serverless technologies, you pay only for when, whenever it runs, not like always running and then uh, keep polling it. Another common example is uh, image processing or recognition using uh, serverless model. So let's say you have a web application. The users are authenticated through Cognito and then user, whenever they upload an image, it goes to S3, which can automatically trigger a Lambda function. S3 can automatically trigger a Lambda function whenever a put object has been invoked. That Lambda function will make a call to step function. A step function, at the same time, parallelly invoke multiple stage steps, like it can extract the image metadata, and it can also go and identify objects in the metadata, and then you can also do moderation as part of this stages, and then identify whether that image is appropriate for this for the web application to be uploaded or not. You can able to handle that in a serverless way. And at the same time, it also creates a thumbnail. Everything happens parallelly. And once it is done, it will send a response back to DynamoDB saying that the operation has been completed. And the end user will be able to see that the operation has been completed when, when the image processing has been completed. So this is a simple example of how a step function flow looks. As you look, so there is, the first, it performs an image metadata extraction. If it is identified, it is able to do, then it will be continuing to the next part. If not, it will just terminate there itself. Then if it is able to continue, it just performs parallel operations to recognition and also create a thumbnail. And once both the parallel operations are completed, you will get send the response back to DynamoDB table. Okay, now let's look at an example of stream processing. So when it comes to stream processing, uh, it again has its own characteristics, like it has a high ingestion rate. Sometimes it will be a bust capacity, the scaling happens, like let's say there's a video, like a news article that's create a sudden spike, or there's a TV program that can create a sudden spike. So those kind of spikes if you want to handle. Uh, and again, another characteristics like durability of the message and the order of the message should be maintained. So when you have these kind of characteristics, you can look at services like this kind of architecture where you can use Kinesis. Kinesis is a stream processing service. So you can use your web application or a client to send all the uh, event to the Kinesis streams, and the Kinesis streams will trigger the Lambda function. So in this case, we have two Lambda functions. The first Lambda function uh, will be able to up write the data to DynamoDB for a kind of a real-time analysis. At the same time, you can also create a custom matrix and then write it to CloudWatch as part of that. There's another Lambda function. The parallelly, it can write the raw data to S3 so that at any point in time, you can able to see what happened at the raw data and then you're able to go through it. Or if you want to do an uh, uh, event kind of, event streaming kind of thing, you can able to do an event streaming and then uh, check what happened and then do a playback of all the events that happened so far. Another typical example of uh, stream processing is IoT. So where you have a huge set of IoT sensors which collects all the data and send it to the IoT gateway. IoT Gateway will send that uh, data to IoT rules, 
IoT rules, based on the rules that you have defined, it will be performing multiple actions. That can be single actions or a multiple actions. As you see here, in this case, it writes, have multiple actions. One of them is writing the record directly to S3. The next one is you can write it to Kinesis analytics streams so that you can perform a real-time analytics. Or you can also write to the Kinesis Firehose, which directly dumps all the data to S3. You can also do transformation as part of Firehose so that you can able to write the process data when it writes to S3. So another example is batch processing. When it comes to batch processing, as you see here, this, this looks like a map reduce kind of an use case where, uh, as you see, there is a, a big data that is sitting in S3. So there's a Lambda function which goes and get this data and then uh, create a uh, mapper task so that it just creates small chunks of tasks and then put that into queue. That, that queue will automatically trigger multiple Lambda functions. The Lambda functions will be performing its own operations based on the message in that message queue. And then it will be able to write the data to DynamoDB. Once the data is in the DynamoDB, then the reduces script will be able to execute and then able to reduce all the multiple uh, operations that is being performed by multiple different Lambda functions and then provide the results in S3. So you can able to kind of uh, build up your own map reduce kind of environment using Lambda and various serverless solutions. Whereas there is also other uh, AWS services like Glue, Athena, uh, QuickSight, and Redshift Spectrum, which can help you to perform analytics directly on S3 data. So similar to this, so we have an, uh, another use case like Fanimi. So it's a uh, financial modeling company. They want to model their uh, mortgage uh, data for the financial modeling. So they, they were thinking about moving their uh, on-premise environment to AWS. And when they looked at serverless, they were able to achieve whatever they can do with their existing infrastructure in uh, almost very less amount of time compared to what they are doing on-premise and that enabled them to uh, handle very huge load of data and at a very low cost compared to what they were already doing. Okay, now let's look at a quick demo. So here is a simple architecture of this demo. So we have a static files in S3 bucket, uh, which has HTMLs and JavaScripts and CSS files. And when we make an API call, it will send an API request to API gateway, which will trigger a Lambda function the Lambda function at the same time will be making an API call to Comprehend. So Comprehend is a natural language processing service to identify what is the sentiment of the data that we have provided. And based on the sentiment, it will give a response back. And it also make an API call to translate, to translate to a different language. So this is an example of positive chat. So we are building a chat application where you make sure that uh, only positive content are displayed in the chat and the negative contents are not allowed. Okay, so here, so I'm logging in as a user Prakash and I want to translate, let's say to French. As you see here, actually in kind of a near real time, it is able to translate the language and then provide you the response back. And it also able to, as you see here, it also able to identify in what language that I have provided the input. So as you see here, it also able to identify which the language I say, and then it can able to translate it. So again, and kind of again, I can able to change the language in real time. So as you see here, it, it can able to translate in real time whatever language that I select. Now let us say I am I'm posting a negative message. It automatically identifies this is a negative message and then it immediately sends a response like, and this will be visible only to my user. It won't be visible to the other users. So for me, it will say like, please express. Okay, so this is a simple demo. And if you look at the code, it is so simple. 
So I have, so I have the index.html, which is basically an HTML file, which is referring to the index.js JavaScript file. So this is the index.js JavaScript file, which lists all the languages that we are supporting. And it makes an API call to an API gateway endpoint. And that API gateway endpoint will make a uh, call to the lambda function, which is the lambda function. This lambda function have a WebSocket connection uh, to the API gateway. And uh, it will make, so this lambda function is what performing the API call to translate, to get the translated message, make the API call to the comprehend to identify the negative sentiment, and then able to say, okay, what, what, whether it is appropriate or not. So you see here, it is not more than 300 lines of code. And I have automated everything with serverless application model. So this is basically the serverless application model template. As you see here, I'm creating an API here. And I'm creating API integration. And I also have DynamoDB table. So I'm storing the data in DynamoDB table so that I can able to retrieve it much faster way. So I don't need to go and uh, get the data in a different, every time I don't need to make an API call for this. And here is the API gateway. So as you see here, this is just three call to the socket connections. One is connect call, disconnect call, and default call. So all of them is going to the backend Lambda function that I showed in the app.js file. And the data are stored in DynamoDB table. So if you look at the conversation table, we can see whatever we, disc we typed so far. As you see here, it stores the translated content, so it can able to bring up the content immediately and then um, provide that uh, data as a endpoint. So now let's say like I log into this as a different user. So you can see the same messages that, that you have seen there. At the same time, if you see, it, it didn't show the message that it showed to us. Like whenever I type a negative content, that message will be visible only to that particular user. See here, right? But it won't be visible for the other users. So it will be only available, when, only when it is Yeah, this is with the demo. Moving to the slides back. Okay, so with this, uh, hope this gives you an introduction to serverless and also what are the different kind of architectures that you can try with serverless applications. And thank you. Please rate the session.